The following interview was conducted with Bill Smoot, Purdue Class of 1969 for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, October 22, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Bill, good morning and thank you very much for this chance to have a little conversation. Well, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. Okay. Tell us a little bit about where and when you were born and your parents in early years and then high school. Okay. Um, I was born in Maysville, Kentucky in 1947. Um, I was an only child. My mother was Helen Rosen Smoot and my father William R. Smoot. Uh, my mother was a teacher and my father sold life insurance. And I graduated from Maysville High School in 1965. Okay. Any, tell us a little about that. Any clubs or activities and how large a school? Any teachers that you still recall? Well, it was, uh, you know, a, just a small town public high school. Uh-huh. Um, I probably, I mean, one of the teachers I remember, of course, is my mother who taught me two years of Latin. Oh, wonderful. She was at the school. How yes, great. <laughs> uh -huh. And I probably particularly remember an algebra teacher named uh, Gertrude Collins and uh -huh. um, a psychology teacher named Bob Hellard. You know, there were there were some really solid teachers there. Sure, right. Of course, it was a you know it was a small town school, and uh -huh. so you know some of the things that I now realize exist in high school, like advanced level courses and AP courses and all of that. Sure. And none of that existed there, but I, you know, it was a kind of a solid, if modest, high school education. Right, uh-huh. And I had been interested as a boy and teenager in the physical world. I mean, mechanics, chemistry. I was a ham radio operator when I was growing up. And so I decided I wanted to be an engineer. I, had, I think I had the idea that engineers built things, and mm -hmm. that appealed to me. Okay. So that was why I chose Purdue. Mm -hmm. um, entered intending to study engineering in the fall of 1965. Okay. And did you make a visit beforehand? Did you come before you enrolled? Or? I did. Okay. Yes, I did. Okay. So you had a look at the campus and things of that mm -hmm. sort? Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. And it, you know, it was a bit of a, a transition um, for me. I was you know, I sat in classes that were larger than my entire high school. <laughs> that um, is a big transition. You know, the large lecture hall courses of, you know, uh, the first math course for engineers and so on. Sure. And I, I realized over the next couple of semesters that probably I didn't really want to be an engineer. Um, you know, it, it wasn't sitting in a bench designing and building things. Okay. And, you know, my high school had not really had much in the way of what we think of as humanities courses. Sure, okay. So I took a few of those at Purdue and really fell in love with that side of life. Okay. And, you know, one course that was uh, extremely important for me was an introduction to philosophy class um, taught by a really great teacher named William Gass, um, who went on to become very well known as a as a writer mm -hmm. um, and so I changed my major to uh, to the humanities eventually graduated in philosophy okay and uh, I joined a fraternity Sigma Chi fraternity which you know though uh, by my senior year I would sort of outgrow it and, and outgrow that culture when I joined it as a freshman it was very uh, good for me uh -huh. I mean, Important thing because sure. it, you know it provided a sort of hominess and intimacy that I, I think I found lacking in the large dormitories. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that was important uh, to being a student at Purdue is I decided I wanted to write for the newspaper. And eventually, I was given a, a regular column on the editorial page. Uh, became the associate editor in my junior year and then editor-in-chief um, for my senior year. Okay. And, of course, <laughs> there were a, a number of events associated with that that were really sort of life-changing for me uh -huh. for the paper. Okay. 
and I, I can go into those whenever you want. Well, you can. Ma I'll leave it up to you. You make it the comments as since you're sharing your conversation with us and we're the researchers okay. or whatever. I'll leave it up to you. Well, when I, you know, when I got to Purdue in 1965. Uh, Purdue was a you know a very traditional and conservative place, uh -huh. and you know the what we now think of as the '60s had begun to manifest itself at places like Berkeley. Sure, but Purdue was far removed from that. And so, by the time I was writing for the newspaper, you know, 1967, 1968, um, there was a you know there were there were certain issues. Um, that were important in the country that were beginning to also be felt at Purdue. Uh -huh. And in particular, I think, oh, they fell into three areas. One would be um, race relations. Uh, two would be the war in Vietnam, to which there was beginning to be some opposition. And then the third area might just have to do with, you know, the relation of students to the administration. Um, and you know rules and regulations that some students felt um, you know really kind of restricted their freedom okay and so the, the newspaper in some ways um, became interested in reporting those events and even advocating for certain kinds of things and this began to uh, really upset the administration and you know, this sort of escalated month by month over a period of several years. And by the time I became editor of the newspaper, it became clear that the administration really looked at the paper, um, well, this, of course, would be my term, but as a kind of public relations arm for the university and presenting the university's image to the world. And we said, no, that, you know, you, you have uh, offices in the university for that. Uh, you have, in fact, a public relations office. We're a free student press with the obligation of any press to, you know, report on the news uh, based on our news judgment and on the editorial page to advocate for issues. And uh, this conflict really sort of came to a head in November, I believe it was, of 1968 when the president of the university, who was Fred Hufty at the time, um, simply announced that he was removing me as editor, firing me as editor of the paper. And we were all called into the administration building one morning and um, told of that. And so um, we all got back to the newspaper office and met about it and talked about it. And uh, people began making phone calls to, you know, lawyers and so on. And we finally decided that the university didn't have the right to do that, um, that there were actually important First Amendment issues involved. And so we simply refused to acknowledge his right to fire the editor and continued to publish the paper. And so at that point, the ball was in their court. They either had to well, basically sending the police to shut down the newspaper, um, which would have, you know, made them look like the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. or else find some way out. And they took the latter. They um, have the announced that he was holding his decision in abeyance, as he called it, um, and appointing a committee to look into the issue and make a recommendation. Okay. And when the committee was appointed, you know, there were people that said, oh, look, this is a trick of Hubdi's. He's clearly chosen a fairly conservative committee. And basically what's going to happen is that they're going to, you know, uh, support his decision. And I was one of those who felt, I, you know, don't be so sure. I think that reason is so firmly on our side that I actually kind of trust the committee, and I, and I thought they were people of integrity. Mm -hmm. was, it all, was it an all-faculty committee, Phil, or was it a... It was... Uh, was there staff on there, too, or...? It was mostly faculty, and I believe there were a couple of students on it. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I remember that the chairman of the committee was a, a professor of entomology. Okay. Um, and so anyway, they you know, took some weeks and conducted a complete investigation. And to the surprise of some, 
announced their decision that uh, that Huffy's decision had been ill-advised, and they recommended setting up a kind of route to make the newspaper independent of the university and clear up any ambiguity about who was the legal publisher and who was responsible and so on. Uh And so that, in fact, was done. Uh, It was, you know, instituted the the year after I graduated. And, uh, you know, the Purdue Exponent became one of the first truly independent college newspapers in the country. Oh, I didn't Maine, realize so that. so to this you. day, has uh-huh. its own building, its own press, and, right. you know, the, the end of that story for the newspaper ended up being a very happy one. All right. Did you continue on as the editor uh, be, until you graduated? Yes, I oh. finished out my term. Okay. Um, so after this was uh, decision, then the paper continued on? Yes, it did. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, then is it after this? Is this when you went on to uh, Northwestern after you finished, or what? Uh, yes, I graduated from Purdue in the spring of 1969. Okay. And the next uh, fall, enrolled at Northwestern University in a PhD program in philosophy. Okay. And uh, received my PhD in 1973. Uh huh. How did you have to select Northwestern? You're staying, at least you're staying in the Midwest, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Something like well, that. Well, actually, it, I was, you know, my primary interest in philosophy were in 19th and 20th century European philosophy. Okay. And particularly phenomenology and existentialism. Okay. And so Northwestern was particularly strong in that area. And also they had uh, kind of rolling admissions. And so I was given admission soon after I applied. Okay, sounds good. I also applied to a couple of other places. Uh Um, Princeton, which probably wasn't a a very good fit in terms of area. Um, Yale, which would have been a a pretty good fit. And somewhat to my surprise, I was denied admission at both of those. Hmm. A year later, I would find out that the Purdue administration took it up on itself to contact the places I had applied for graduate school to warn them that I was a dangerous radical and should not be admitted. And so it seems that that was what uh, prevented me from being admitted to Princeton and Yale. Mm. At Northwestern, I had already been admitted, but I did find out, and, and this was confirmed the next year, that it prevented me from being awarded a fellowship. Hmm. And yeah. so um, one, of the, you know, one of the conclusions I drew from that is that the administration was at Purdue had been so angry about my role there that it was not just you know, that they were trying to protect what they saw as their interest, but hmm. were really sort of vindictive about it. Yeah. Okay. The story had a happy ending because even though it was uh, it was going to be a, a great uh, financial burden, right? I, I went to Northwestern anyway of uh, the first quarter. Um, you know, my parents came up with the tuition money, uh-huh. and then I was given an assistantship. Wonderful. And so I got you know it, I ended up uh, teaching and uh, being given you know free tuition for the, the rest of my career there. Wonderful. So that, too, ended up being a, you know, a kind of happy ending. Right. God look, was looking over on you. <laughs> Maybe so. Right. Um, then let's move on afterwards. Is that when, is, when you finished it, is that when you went to Miami University? Yes. Okay. I, um, I went to Miami University um, in 1974 uh-huh. and taught uh, in the philosophy department there for three years. Uh-huh. And you know, by now it was the 70s, and the the academic job market had become uh, very bad. Okay. And so uh, my position at Miami was a non-tenure track position, so I was going to have to um, you know find another another sure. position somewhere. Right. And at that point, I decided to. Um, at the end of the third year, take some time off. So I, I moved to Berkeley. Okay. And uh, 
oh, I got a one semester visiting appointment at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. That was in, in 1978. And at that point, you know, it was in kind of a career crisis because the academic job market had, had just collapsed. Uh -huh. You know, every position that was open had 200 applicants for it, and, and there weren't very many positions in philosophy. Sure. So I kind of stumbled into uh, the world of private schools. Okay. And, you know, would eventually realize that, it, that I was probably happier doing that and better suited for that than if I had, you know, continued on in, the, in a university setting. Okay. okay. And I think there are two reasons for that. One is, you know, private schools are very much teaching oriented. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's no expectations for research. And then the other is that, you know, breadth is rewarded. And what I would sort of realize I don't think I consciously realized it until after I was out of graduate school, but I was I was really by by inclination more of a humanities generalist. Okay. I mean, I, I was certainly interested in philosophy, but I also loved literature. I was interested in art and the history of art. Um, I was interested in general in the history of ideas, including fields that are outside of philosophy, like the history of science. All right. And English, um, too, as well. English yes. you've been teaching, right. Absolutely. Right. And, of course, you know, to be a, I mean, the, the key to success in being a professor is really to specialize. Right. So for that reason, in private schools, I've taught history, I've taught and still teach philosophy, as well as literature courses. Mm -hmm. And so I think I've been happier and, and better suited to that. So, you know, that, too, has worked out well. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the schools. The first one was that... Uh, uh, the, uh, the county in Berkeley, but then from 84 to 92, you were at the College Preparatory School in Oakland. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Tell us a little about that, and then your well, current one where you're you know, at now. It's an excellent college preparatory school in Oakland. Okay. Um, I taught mostly history classes there. Uh huh. Um, and and you were on the curriculum committee, too. Yes. Uh huh. Okay. And then in uh, 92, I guess it was, uh, I'm moved, I sort of changed disciplines in a way from, uh -huh. from being in the history department to deciding to go to the Castilea School and uh, teach in the English department. Okay. The, the head there had, you know, had sort of felt that there were things I could bring to the English department there. I think he sort of wanted to, I mean, he felt that some of the, some of the graduates were feeling or had been feeling that they needed more intellectual challenge in some of their courses. Okay. And so I was sort of brought there to provide that. Okay. And then I guess it was the third year I was there was made uh, head of the English department. Uh huh. So I've actually been at Castilea now. This, uh, this is my 19th year. I know. And uh, have been teaching in the English department. I usually teach one philosophy course every year or every other year. And then the other classes that I teach are English classes. Okay. How large is the school? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Is it both girls and boys? Yes, it's, it's actually an all-girls school, oh, okay. also a college preparatory school in, okay. in Silicon Valley. Okay. Um, and uh, it's very much like college prep in Oakland, except that it's uh, single sex instead of co-ed. Sure, okay. And I've had, you know, many, many wonderful students over a over 19 years and you know there are days when I think I can't believe they pay me to do this it's, it's isn't so, that a nice feeling <laughs> it is it's I, so enjoyable right and, so and I noticed that you were the advisor to the student newspaper uh-huh I <laughs> was at one point yeah absolutely <laughs> oh that was kind of deja vu <laughs> yes really <laughs> Uh, let's talk a little bit about, and you also, that you designed and implemented a pilot teaching intern program. I did yeah, for a while. Us, you know, tell us a little about that, what that would involve. It's kind well, of interesting. You know, in, the, in some ways, the world, uh, in, in private schools, um, it's not required to have a teaching credential. Oh, okay. And a number of the people, including myself, uh, do not. Okay. And so one of the things that I felt was important for private schools to do <clears throat> was sort of bring on, 
you know, very new teachers, excuse me, and, uh, you know, mentor them and help develop them into teachers. Okay. So for a few years, we had a, a kind of intern program uh -huh. where we would bring uh, people on as interns and sort of give them their start in the profession. Good. Well, that's good experience for you and also for the doing some mentoring and also for the teacher as well. That's true. Yeah, good, good idea. A um, couple, let's talk about some of your synergistic activities. That um, fellowship that you got for independent study, which was sponsored by NEH and the Council for Basic Education Study. Can you make mm -hmm. a comment on that? And then a couple of the NEH summer seminars that you had for teachers. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that um, you know I've always remained interested in is is writing. Right. And have done uh, a variety of kinds of writing over the years. I've uh, you know I've written some fiction, some essays, um, some scholarly articles. And so along the way, there have been um, you know there was the um, the Council for Basic Education grant that allowed me to do a summer study and then um, write an essay based on that. Mm -hmm. And then the NEH seminars are just a way for teachers to go back and kind of have what amounts to a graduate level seminar in some area over the summer. Okay. So I did, I did one at Stanford one summer on tragedy. Yes, I see that. Right. Okay. had already been an interest of mine and, and you know, then became a part of my teaching because one of the AP classes that I teach usually every other year is a course on tragedy. And in that course, I teach not only uh, works of literature that are tragedies, Sophocles, Shakespeare, um, Arthur Miller, um, the Faulkner novel, The Sound and the Fury, but I also bring in theories of tragedy, which is something I'm able to do having a background in philosophy. Right. So I present to students the theories of tragedy of Aristotle, Hegel, and Nietzsche. And so in some ways, having that NEH seminar was a way to help me sort of bring all of that together and design a, a course that, in fact, I'm teaching it again this semester. Oh, are so you? Okay. It's something I've been doing for quite a while now. Sounds like a good course. I think it is. I yeah. think it is. It's got a lot that the students can absorb and learn from. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, you also did that the one uh, one of those seminars at California State when you did four texts in the Japanese culture. That's right. interesting. Did you? Yeah, I mean, my you know my background is primarily in you know in Western culture. Uh huh. So this was a way uh, to sort of branch out and you know get an exposure to Japanese literature, which was a completely new area for me. Sure, it was a good good thing. Let's talk a little bit more about your writing the essays and then. The short story and also a couple of the novels, particularly the, le the most recent one. I'd be interested in some comments on those. Well, the novels, uh, the, you know, the first novel um, called Promises Kept uh -huh. was uh, sort of a novel set on the Berkeley campus at the time of the free speech movement. Okay. And that novel was published by a very small press and it, you know, basically didn't get much in the way of distribution or, or notice, mm -hmm. so it wasn't very successful. Okay. Uh, the second novel is, it has never found a publisher, and whether I will at some point, you know, work on it again and try to get it published, you know, I'm not really sure. Okay. I've been more successful at finding uh, places for the short fiction, Okay. Um, you know, certain short stories, and then I've also, you know, written essays over the years. Okay. But what about, isn't that Conversation with Great Teachers, isn't that one your most recent one? Did Indiana that's, Press? Yes, yeah, that's, um, that's in some ways, I guess, my most successful publication. It just came out uh, last summer. Good. Uh, it was published by University, uh, by Indiana University Press. Right, yes. And it was a completely different kind of writing for me, something that I never really thought I would do. But, you know, over the years, I was I always enjoyed reading the books of Studs Terkel. I'd actually read the first one when I, when I was in graduate school okay. at Northwestern. Sure. He was this old Chicago-area radio journalist who had done a series of books that were basically just interviews with, with people. ordinary Americans about their lives. Mm -hmm. I think his, his most successful was probably Working, okay. which came out in the early 70s. 
And so over the years, I remember thinking, I wish he would someday do a book of interviews with teachers. I think that would be fascinating. And, oh, four or five years ago, I, I remember reading that uh, Turkle was in failing health. He was over 90 by then and would do no more books. And so I, I got this idea, what if I were to just try to do that sort of book myself? Okay. And it, you know, it seemed audacious. I thought, well, I, you know, I've never written that kind of thing. And, you know, but then I thought, well, what if I just start? I'll try to do a few interviews, and I'll <laughs> see how they go, and I'll see if it interests me. Okay. So I, I did a few, and it was fascinating. What, kind of, what teachers were, were you talking about, high school or college or well, grade what, school? Well, Eventually, I mean, initially I thought I will do teachers at every level in the classroom from okay. kindergarten through the university. Okay. And I also thought, should I just do a variety of teachers, that might have been Turkle's way, or should I try to find great teachers? Okay. And I decided to go the latter route. So I tried to, you know, find teachers who were truly outstanding. Okay. I thought I wanted to, you know, try to explore what it is that makes a great teacher and what great teachers are like and what they have in common. So then the other way that the book kind of changed after I started is it occurred to me that in any society, everything that is known, every kind of knowledge, every skill, every form of wisdom has to be transferred. And it certainly a lot of that happens in the classroom, right. kindergarten through the university. Correct. But a lot of it happens outside it. That's right. So I, I started to explore people who taught in other realms of life. And so by the time the book was finished, there are 51 interviews in it, um, more than half of them are outside of the classroom. So, for example, there are some people who teach um, athletic performance okay um, in fact one rather well-known person in the book is Ron Washington um, the manager of the Texas Rangers who's you know as we speak in the playoffs battling the the Yankees okay um, for the American League pennant and I found out about him through a couple of sports writers and it, it turned out that he's a real genius for teaching uh, professional baseball players the art of playing the infield and so I was able to get an interview with him about that and sure enough I mean I could see that he he is a master teacher deep and thoughtful about how you develop this skill in in baseball players and so that you know there ended up being I mean there's a pastry a world-famous pastry chef um, there's even someone who teaches alligator wrestling. There are a couple of corporate consultants. Um, there's a man who was one of the primary political mentors of Barack Obama when he was in the Illinois State Senate. Okay. Um, Bill, how former did you Secretary get your Secretary of State okay. George Schultz, who you know has mentored um, Condi Rice and others. Sure. So it ended up being about teachers in, in the broadest sense of the word. Okay. How did you, uh, when you broadened the scope, uh, did you compile a list or, or people that you really felt would slot into these particular themes, such as sports or, 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 or Condoleezza Rice, whatever? And you did orals. You did oral history, uh, interviews with them? Yes, they okay. were all interviews. Okay. Um, some in person and some on the phone. All right. Okay. And uh, they, you know, I found out about the various people in a, in a wide variety of ways. Sometimes I had read about them. Um, a couple of the sports people, for example, I found by writing to um, to sports writers at newspapers. All right. And I said, do you know anyone in the world of professional sports who's really a master teacher, in, you know, in the best sense of the term? Sure. And that's how I found out about two people, one who teaches the art of shooting a basketball and also about uh, Ron Washington. Okay. Um, and then, oh, in another case, I thought, you know, someone, there got to be people out there who are great ballet teachers. So right. I kind of just started researching in the, you know, people who write about dance and the dance world. And the name Suki Shore, um, herself a former ballerina, um, 
kept coming up as a real master teacher who's now been at the American Ballet Theater School in New York for many years. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I found out about her. So, it, you know, um, they came about in a variety of ways, usually with me having a kind of vague or general idea like, hey, somebody in sports or somebody in ballet, and then from that finding out a specific person or a specific subcategory. Right. Okay. I have to get my, I'm going to plan to get my hands on a copy of that book. I just think it's, it's very nice. How did you happen to, um, how did you get the press to publish or did you know someone? How did that work out? Oh, it's nice. It's in Indiana. <laughs> yes. Affiliation. My, my, my life keeps returning to Central Indiana. <laughs> um, actually, I got it. I started trying to get an agent and I was able to get a literary agent in New York. Okay. And so he uh, sent it around first to, you know, some of the more commercial houses. And there was good news and bad news. The good news was everybody really praised the book and its quality. Okay. Uh, the bad news was the commercial publishers were saying, you know, uh, we've got to be able to sell fifteen to 20,000 hardback copies, and we're not sure there's going to be the market for it. Okay. So they passed on it. Okay. Okay. And then he said, well, let's try university presses. And, and Indiana University Press has a really top reputation. And they're much larger than ours is, I think. So that was the right. first place that he tried. And uh -huh. also, one of the things, you know, it used to be that university presses only did academic books. Uh -huh. So, you know, if you'd written about, I don't know, some topic in chemistry or, you know, the life of baboons or, you know, mm -hmm. archaeological excavations, so you'd go to a, a university press. More recently, um, some university presses are doing, you know, kind of general trade books, books that have a certain intellectual foundation but aren't really geared toward academic specialists. Right. And so that my book clearly fits into that category, and, uh, you know, the university press books aren't so commercial. I mean, they're not saying, look, we've got to be able to sell 20,000 right. copies or we're right. not interested. Right. So Indiana University took it, and I, you know, I've been very happy with, um, Good. with them. Good. And the book's now in its second printing. So what? it's. Did you, know, you do any book signing? Did you have any like that? I or? have. I oh. have indeed, yeah. Where'd you do, where did you have some book signings? Um, I've done them in the Bay Area, and okay. the, the most recent one was actually two weeks ago, okay. and it, it was filmed by C-SPAN Books Channel, on, oh. you know, the television channel. Sure, okay. So sometime in the next month or two, it's, it's, that signing is going to be on the air. All right, I'll have to watch for it, because I do like that program. I, we used to watch it when um, Brian Lamb did a lot of those, you know, it was mm -hmm. really in the early mm -hmm. days. That's very nice. Good. Um, family, can you tell us about that? Well, I'm uh, married, okay. uh, don't have any children, but okay. have a wonderful dog. Okay, um, that's family, very that's key. Definitely. I got two cats. <laughs> that is. <laughs> do you, and do you live, fairly, do you live uh, fairly close to where the school is, or? Actually, I have, I'm sorry to say I have a bit of a commute. I live in Berkeley, and the school's in Palo Alto. Okay, so. okay. Right. Well, that's not too bad. Uh, a couple of the awards, let's talk about the... Um, Outstanding Teacher Award that you got from Miami, and also the Distinguished Faculty Award from the school that you're currently with, as well as the Faculty Baccalaureate Speaker for a number of times. Mm -hmm. Well, um, at M Miami, uh, they basically gave um, teaching awards. I mean, I th my understanding was it was largely quantitative. It was based on student evaluations. Okay. And so the h most highly evaluated teachers you know, I think there were five every year across uh -huh. the university, uh -huh. um, received this award. And it was in, actually in my first year of teaching. So it was, you know, quite an honor and... and uh, That's right. You very, know, very good. Let me know my, my instincts were good. <laughs> and then um, at Castilea, it's done in a similar way. Students make nominations. Uh -huh. And then there's a committee that reads through the, the nominations and makes a selection and uh, I won that award some years ago so that also was you know was very gratifying right it's nice to have your have get that recognition from the students mm -hmm. right. it is it is and then you were the baccalaureate speaker a couple times too and that's nice 
Yes, I've actually I've done it. I think it's five times now, uh -huh. and that also the senior class will vote on a faculty member um, that they want to speak at the baccalaureate ceremony. Yeah, good. You're right there, right there. Well, that's right. nice. Sending them, yeah, sending yeah. them off, right? <laughs> right, exactly. Right. Uh, that CAIS speaker uh, in March of '95, bridging theory and practice in effective teaching. That sounds kind of. What is that particular organization? Well, it's. It, it stands for the California Association of Independent Schools. Okay. So all, all right. the, you know, the the non-public schools have their own uh, association. Both independent and parochial um, are members of this uh, organization, and they right. have a a conference once a year. And there are speakers at the conference who talk about topics related to teaching and education. And I've uh, I've been a speaker at that. Uh, I guess it's three times now. Good. Very good. Okay. Uh, do you now favorite Purdue tradition? Do you still have one that you'd like to share with us after all this time, or one that you recall? Oh, Purdue tradition. Yeah. Um, well, of course, in the in the period that I was there, sure. you know, in some ways the traditions were, were you know, were being challenged, <laughs> uh, and um, you know, some of the things that I I kind of best remember. Uh -huh. um, you know, probably weren't part of the traditions, but you know, I mean, I, in some ways, I think my fondest memories of Purdue okay. um, have to do with um, all of us working together at the exponent. Okay. I mean, in some ways, I think there's no, you know, and people in the theater often say this, students in the theater, but you know, there's nothing quite so special as just working with a group of people on a common goal. Right. Exactly. Um, and then facing challenges and adversity as as we certainly did right and working um, so, working through it right <laughs> and so that's you know that's, that's nice. certainly one important member and the other i think would just be a certain classroom memories i mean there were some great teachers there um and i had some you know some really valuable experiences in the classroom okay let me ask you this did you have a course from professor schrag i did okay uh, he's now retired, as you probably know, and I, uh, I'm very pleased to say I recently did an interview with him for the program. Oh, is that right? Right, yes. He, um, he would, in fact, I would, not only did I have him, but, you know, he, his area of specialization, phenomenology and existentialism, right. was what I ended up being most interested in. That's right, and so I thought about that a, when you mentioned that. I had three or four classes under him, mm -hmm. and he was a very important uh, teacher for me. Right, yes. Now, gee whiz, he, he must be, uh, I'm not I mean, I'm 63, what, he must be, what, in his 90s? Maybe? I'm not sure how old he is. Uh, he's been retired for quite a period of time, but it was a very nice interview. We, we, I haven't done the tra got the transcript, but it was really nice, and I, was, uh, I had seen him around campus, but it was nice to really be able to have the chance to do that. Same with, my, with you. Um, do you have an out? Uh, oh, there's, actually, there's one other kind of serendipitous thing. Uh -huh. My first scholarly publication uh, was in an international philosophy journal, okay. of which he was one of the editors. Oh my goodness! What a small world. That's nice. So it, you know, <laughs> that's um, nice to hear. That was kind of, kind of special. I, also for me, that you know, the man who first taught me existentialism right. and ended up publishing a paper I did on Sartre. Yeah, very good. Um, do you have an outstanding event or events that you'd like to share with us? Even from Purdue? No, anything. It doesn't have to be Purdue-related. Anything that comes to mind. Outstanding event. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Any kind of event you're especially... Well, sometimes thinking. people say, um, when I met my wife or the children or um, just being, you know, being able to be in the classroom, you know. Mm -hmm. Interacting with the, with the students and uh, th kinds of things like that. Sometimes people have also said that they participated in commencement. It's really nice to be able to shake the hand of some the students that they've interacted with. So it varies, mm -hmm. you know. So go right. So I'll leave it up to you if you have. Oh, have, through, I mean, there's so many important yeah, events to, right. in life. Certainly, being the baccalaureate speaker at my school has been a high point. Good choice. Um, you know, that would be one. Getting, I think that my my wedding would be, certainly be another. Okay. And then another. I mean, this sounds uh, c probably strange and so sad, but um, being present at my mother's death. 
Hmm. Which okay. was in some ways, of course, terribly sad, but I think one of the most um, memorable and, and meaningful moments of my life, and in fact, I, I later wrote an essay about it, which got published. Okay. That's a, it, I think, you know, some of the great moments in life are not, not just the happy ones. That's right, exactly. And it's nice to be there because it's family. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, any questions, any topic that, or question that I forgot to ask that uh, you'd like to comment on? And then I thought I'd ask you, if the student uh, being a teacher at the, the middle school, high school level, transition from high school to college, what, any comments that you'd say on that? Okay. I'll let it wrap up for you. Um, well, on the, on the first question, you know, I guess one of the things that I think about when I think back on my days at Purdue, and for, for which, to be honest with you, I feel a certain amount of pride, is that um, a year and a half ago I was contacted by a group that was making a documentary film mm -hmm. on the history of blacks at Purdue. Okay. And because of my activities as editor of the paper, I was one of the people they selected to, to interview for it. Uh -huh. And in fact, I, so I flew to New York for the interview and, and met a couple of people um, who I hadn't seen since 1969. Oh my goodness. Uh, a couple of the, the black students who had been important there okay. in the, you know, sort of the black protest movement at Purdue. Uh-huh. And they, you know, they put the film together and then sent me a copy. And one of the things I realized, uh, you know, about uh, the progress of blacks at Purdue is that, you know, in 1969, some of those black students and you know, also the Purdue exponent and me as editor, were looked at as problems. I mean, you know, okay. the administration obviously thought we were hurting the university and wished we would go away. But when I, when I watched the film, it was clear to me that um, Purdue now has reason to feel proud for the tremendous progress made from a day when you know, blacks could attend Purdue but couldn't find any place to live, mm -hmm. um, and that now there, you know, there there are viable programs. There are alums in all sorts of areas, from you know, engineering to to law, who are distinguished distinguished blacks black alums of Purdue, right. and that you know, our little efforts that were looked at as as problematic in 1969. Now, from the view of a longer period of history, I mean, you know, it's, that was now 40 years ago. Right. It, it's clear that it, 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 was, it was positive, and it was an, an important element of the progress. Right, okay. And so I think sometimes in life, you know, people who, who make noise or complain or launch protests are regarded as, as problems, but that that's that's part of human progress right. and that when you look take a longer view of history that becomes evident it, it bring and it then, to you the know floor. with regard to the sure. exponent I mean the, the exponent is now you know one of the great viable independent university newspapers in the country right. and that came about you know because we stood up right. in, in 1968 and 69 and you know wouldn't let ourselves be manipulated All right when you were here we, uh, the offices were in Stewart Center the building hadn't been built had it that where the exponent well, is today we were in the basement of the of the student oh, union of the union building. that's where it was okay but the yeah. the exponent building was not built at that time is that correct no definitely okay. not okay okay that's a pretty nice facility very close to I, campus. You know, I keep, I, someday yeah, I hope to get back and see it. I haven't been on campus for decades. Oh, you'll have to come, come back for a class reunion sometime, and that'll give us a chance to get together. I, I definitely should. <laughs> oh, any 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 other closing things or anything that you'd like to share with us, Bill? No, I you know I I think that's all that I can think of. Okay, I really I really appreciate that, and I'm gonna uh, thank you very much. But don't hang up for just a sec. Okay.